getting ready to take another great trip with Destinations Unscripted. And warning, as always, it is unscripted. I decided to stay here at the La Jolla Inn, which is really conveniently located to everything. It's right here, right across from Scripps Park. Uh, I will tell you, if you're going to come here and uh, get a room, do not get one of the bottom floors, get one with the balconies. Uh, the difference is, is night and day. Uh, first, we were checked into the bottom one. The air conditioning wasn't working, so we moved up. And I'm, I'm telling you, it's just much better experience. Nice breeze came through the room, nice balcony. This is a very nice place to stay because you're centrally located. You can walk to a lot of different locations here. And La Jolla parking is an issue. We're in beautiful Beverly Hills, California. One of our many stops up the coast. Let's go see what we can find. We're in beautiful Beverly Hills, California on a wonderful June day. We find ourselves at the Beverly Hills Farmer's Market. Piesta, wherever there's pie, there I am. I'm here with CeCe Bradley, 21 year veteran. Yes, sir. Of the Beverly Hills Farmer's Market. And these are one of those hidden gems that you find when you're out looking for things to do because, well, this is the real culture here, isn't it? Yes, sir. It Fresh is. food, great food, friendly people. Yes. And tell me a little bit more about the Farmer's Market. This Farmer's Market was born out of the community. The community wanted something to happen here for them good fruits and vegetables, culture coming into this neighborhood. So they lobbied the city hall to have this farmer's market and voila, Beverly Hills Farmer's Market was born 21 years ago. I have three generations. That young man over there, Bren, He's the next generation of farmer that has come into this market and we are just pleased as punch that people, farmers, their children are picking up where they left off and they're going forward with a concept that they believe in, good, healthy fruits and vegetables and uh, a place to come get it, a place they can, they can test and uh, trust. Now you were talking about the quality of food, the fresh food. Yes. Um, I noticed a lot of organic food here. Yes. And a do. lot of the farmers here, the small farmers that grow their own, bring it here and sell it. So it's directly farmed to the people yes, without sir. going through all the processing. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And don't you think that a good food source is essential to health? To health, yes. And you're, Definitely. you can't be happy unless you're healthy. That's right. And productive. I think I'm proof of that. I'm 73 years old and I love eating from the farmer's market. I had my plate of vegetables and hummus and it's just wonderful. And I feel good. And at 70, I started classes in yoga. So you get inspired as what you can do moving forward. And I'm still working, so okay. I like that you, part. <laughs> you mentioned another thing was culture, bringing culture in. How, yes. how important to you is that we main, maintain a diverse culture that we all don't get assimilated into one right. because how boring the food would be, how boring the people would be if yes. we're all one culture. Yes. Well, we're at the other end of the Beverly Hills Farmer's Market with one of the original farmers at the Farmer's Market, Harry. Harry, Harry. how old are you? I'm 90, 92 years old. And you still farm and you still drive your truck here? Yes, sir. And you make these beautiful hats? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Harry was telling me he was in World War II on a PT boat over in the Pacific Theater. Pacific, yes. Got any good stories? What that? Any good stories about that? Oh, yeah, a lot of good stories about yeah. it. <laughs> you said your boat got shot up. We got shot up and we shot down one of the airplanes. 
and he went back to his base and there was some Japanese gunboats up there. They came and they came back and they uh, they shot up one more plane and sunk one more, sunk a, a PT boat. Yes. War, wars are, I guess in the, in, the, in the words of some of the wise, wars are hell, aren't they? Oh, right, yeah, right. Very destructive. Yeah. So, it, um, you want to tell me a little bit about where you're from? I'm from uh, Orange Cove, California. That's in Fresno County. And I've been farming there all my life. And uh, I enjoy doing it. And I've been coming to the market about 30 years now. And farmer's market. How many acres do you have? I have 50 acres left. 50. I had 100, I sold some. Now, do you mainly just do fruits? Or do you do other? No, just fruit. Just fruits? Yeah. And what is uh, what's your what's your prized fruit that you farm? What is what's your favorite? Gra grapes. Grapes. Yes. And do you produce table grapes or grapes for wine? No, no table grapes. Table. And what kind of uh, what brand or breed? Well, there's a Tomcord. That's a cross between a Thompson and a Concord grape. They oh. call it Tomcord. I don't think I've ever tasted those. Oh, yeah, that's a good grape. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, I like both of them. I'll have that in about three weeks. Okay. All right. And then I have the Revere's and. Muscat and Autumn Royal, Rubies. That's about it. Well, see, Harry's one of the. I've got kiwis also. Oh, you'd grow kiwi? Yes. Okay, those are good for you. They're good, yeah. <laughs> Everything's good for you in this line, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. One of the interesting people you will meet here when you come to the Beverly Hills Farmers Market, I can't say enough about what a great experience this is to come here. It's off the beaten path and you're gonna get to taste wonderful fruit because to me, I'm gonna get in trouble here, the best fruits, for the most part, I'm not gonna lump everything in there, but the best fruits come from the West, which is the Northern regions or the Central regions to the Northern regions of California and some of Oregon too. Uh, and I, I, you, maybe you can help me with this. Um, I've always thought that it's drier here than it is in the East, humidity wise. So that the fruits, absorb the moisture through the vines more than through the air. Yeah. Is there any legitimacy in what I'm saying? Yeah. That's yes? Right. That's right. So is that why it could be maybe a little bit more flavorful and not as waterlogged? Probably is, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, he's proven one of my theories, and I only had to pay him five bucks to do that. So, <laughs> Harry, thank you very much. Okay. And you keep farming. We'll see you here in 10 more years. Okay. All righty. <laughs>
We're gonna take a tour of this beautiful mansion, and it truly is a mansion. And this mansion was built by the Dohenies. Uh, Mr. Dohini was an oil tycoon, and he gifted this to his son as a wedding gift. But there's a little bit more behind that story. We'll find out about that. We're looking at the front of the Greystone Mansion, uh, and to put this into perspective, this house is about 46,000 square foot. Now, uh, a large house that everyone's familiar with, which is the Hearst Castle, which sets up in San Sinemian on the Big Sur area, that's 90,000. So, if you're going to say it's half the size of Hearst Castle, yes, but it's half the size of Hearst Castle. This is a mammoth house, and think of 46,000 square foot, that's bigger than most grocery stores. Now you've seen the staircase, but I don't know if you recognize the railing system here and the craftsmanship, the workmanship that's in this. This was carved in place, and that's very rare for this type of work. Usually it's carved inside of a shop and brought on set. They'll make a template and then they'll go back and carve it and then bring it on, onto the place where it's going to be permanently placed. And all of this, oh, another neat thing, back for its time, 1927, hidden ventilation system. Keeps the house nice and and cool throughout or warm in the uh, winter but you know Los Angeles usually has pretty perfect weather. They painted this all white in the 1960s for the movie Disorderly Orderly with Jerry Lewis because it was supposed to be a, like a hospital type setting and it almost destroyed the the workmanship and they had to take sandblasters of course in the 1960s it was a, probably a lead-based paint which really adhered and they had to take sandblasters in here very carefully to get it off and bring it back to its natural beauty. Walking through the east and west wing hallway here into the card room. Now this this mansion was built in 1927 and 28, prior to the depression. And it was the most expensive home up until its time ever built in California and thereafter for a while. The cost of this was $3 million. And these are not vinyl floors, that's real marble. And uh, the craftsmanship and worksmanship of the, 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 the craftsmen here in California that, that did this is phenomenal. As I look across the floor, there's not one hump raised lower, nothing, it's all flat. And it remains that way today, even almost 90 years after it was built. This thing was built right. Now, this was the card room, so can you imagine the wagers that were made here with the oil tycoon overlooking the vista out these beautiful old doors overlooking Los Angeles. We are in the famous murder room. And this is where Ned Doheny, the son of the man who built this, that was gifted to, was murdered. And up until just a few years ago, when they refinished these floors, the masking tape that the police used to outline his body was still on the floor. And that was right here where I stand. And there's a lot of different stories that may or may not happened with uh, surrounding this murder. And the funny thing was, it was never investigated that deeply. Uh, there's, there's been rumors that the wife shot both of them. There's been rumors that Ned shot Mr. Plunkett. There's been rumors that Mr. Plunkett shot Ned, then the murder-suicide type thing. But they say, if you're in here at the right time, you can still hear the, and feel the spirits of Ned and Mr. Plunkett. Well, you'll probably notice this room as a morgue in a lot of te television shows. Of course, a dated morgue. Oh, look at what we got here. John Doe. Anyway, this was originally used as probably the gar manger or the place where you would garnish the food after it left the main central kitchen. Let's take a look in here. Now, there's several unique things about this kitchen. One is it's large, of course, it would have to be 
to service the amount of people that would come through here in parties. But this was one of the first refrigeration units in California. Not an ice box, but actual refrigeration. These are original. They have been refinished, so it looks brand new, but they're actually from the 1920s. Well, this is something you didn't see then and you still don't see now. 24 feet solid stainless steel. There are no seams in here. It hasn't been welded. It hasn't been put together. One solid piece. Well, you know, if you've seen me cook, I can cook great food, but I make one heck of a mess. I would love this in my house. I could mess up the whole counter. You're looking at one of only two bowling alleys in the world that is like this. And it is a manual reset bowling lane. All wood, wood pins, really beautiful. It was falling into a state of disrepair when the movie There Will Be Blood with Daniel Day-Lewis in 2007 was filmed here. The movie production company refurbished it, brought it back to its original glory, and it's one heck of a scene if you've seen the end of the film. We're in the billiard room right off of the bowling alley. This is an original pool table. Now, step back in time. It's prohibition. You have a big party. You want to throw some extra favors. It's prohibition. What are you going to do, especially if the cops show up? A bar. Beautiful hidden wall. And can you imagine setting back in that time? Whoops, here comes the police. We'll just close it up, put the drinks back in there. Of course, there's some food being served, so you're not going to smell the alcohol. Is that cool or what? This is the original firehouse that went with the property. Now, this isn't a firehouse for another community. It's just the Doheny property, which at one time comprised over 400 acres. Now, it's down to 14 and a half acres, which still is a large piece of property in Beverly Hills. Beautiful gardens flank either side of this mansion and a beautiful koi pond here. And I'd mentioned before that the city of Beverly Hills, they rent this out for special occasions, be it weddings, private parties, and also corporate events. And what, what a better place to have an event than right here overlooking the city of Los Angeles in a beautiful estate with a lot of history. There are many different ways to enjoy the LA basin and surrounding areas. We're going to choose two of those options on this trip. One is to stay in the excitement in the hub, which Lowe's Hotel, which is downtown Hollywood. And on the way out uh, up the coast, we decided to stay in a place called Agora Hills, about 20 miles north of Los Angeles, about nine miles west of Malibu. So it's a quick jaunt just back down to the city or over to Malibu, and the prices are more reasonable, and it's a little quieter at night. So it depends on what you like, but uh, the room here at the Sheraton was phenomenal. A massive room. The, the mattress was unbelievably comfortable. I'd kind of like to get one of those for my own house. Let's go on up the coast. We're in another world famous location, and that's Malibu, California, right up the coast from Santa Monica, about 10, 12 miles. And it's a, it really, if you're, if you're looking for something full of a lot of excitement and a lot of energy, all that, this is not the place, although you've seen it on TV and in movies portrayed that way, this is a very laid back, relaxed atmosphere and a beautiful beach line, uh, views from up in the hills, a lot of restaurants over the water, quaint little inns, shops, it's a great little place to stay if you're looking for a little bit of relaxation. standing in what I consider to be one of the most beautiful places in the United States, and on a personal note, where I really wanted to move to about 30 years ago, 
came here and was unable to stay because of something else unrelated to myself, and it always broke my heart uh, to even think about this place. It's Santa Barbara, California. It's beautiful. They call it the, the French Riviera of the United States, and for good reason, too. We're at Stern's Wharf in beautiful Santa Barbara, California, and out on the pier, the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, shops, restaurants. There's a lot of history behind this pier in itself. Over 2,250 feet long, over 2,200 pilings. As you can see, people can drive out there and park on the pier. With the backdrop of the beautiful Santa Barbara Mountains and the city, with the palm trees, it doesn't get much better than this. It's a mecca for sailboats, fishermen, kayaking, fishing, sunbathing. And this pier, the Stearns Pier here, is 2,250 feet long. So you're almost, you're past a third of a mile out into the water. Deep water here, uh, the Pacific drops off very rapidly, unlike most of the Atlantic, which has a large shelf. They have shops out here, restaurants. You can actually bring your automobile out here and park almost right to the end of the uh, pier. So it's a massive pier. There's over 2,000 pilings. This was constructed in the 1880s. They've had a fire here at a restaurant, which was rebuilt. So a lot of history right here on this pier. A lot of people have enjoyed this pier, and I think it's something that you should also enjoy. Uh, we took the opportunity to take our bicycles from the hotel that they offer and ride out here. We're at Mountain Air Sports, just a few steps from Stern's Wharf with Joey. Joey's an expert in outdoor activity. Joey, I noticed a lot of kayaks out there. What, what do people see out there? Um, a lot of people are just going out there to um, just have fun on the water. There's good fishing um, off the coast of Santa Barbara. Um, a lot of people cruise around in the harbor. It's right across the street from us, which is nice. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of dolphins, right. seals. Um, certain times of year, you can actually see whales right off the beach here, which is cool. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of wildlife right off the beach, which is nice, and kayaking is a great way to get out there and make it easy. The seals are very playful too, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They'll <laughs> jump up on your boat every once in a while, actually. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like puppy dogs? <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Yeah, that's what Unless they... you have food, they'll come and get it. Yeah. Especially if you're diving in the water, they'll, they'll, they'll come chase you down. Well, I've seen a while, guy so. catch a, a big flounder like this this morning off the pier. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's it's, a... it's not uh, uncommon. And I noticed some yeah. of your kayaks here are kind of like self-contained little fishing uh, vessels. The yeah, one outside had a live well in it, and yeah, Hobie does a, an awesome job with the with the fishing community. <clears throat> They're all pedal driven, so mm -hmm. you just sit back and you kick, and that's your propulsion. You don't have to paddle. They'll have live wells, fish finders, um, all kinds of good stuff set up for fishing or just going out and kicking around. If you're not even fishing, just having fun. Right. Um, it's a really cool cool boat. I think in the United States, this is probably the ultimate with weather being conducive to outdoor activities right here in Santa Barbara because it's always perfect, right? Yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> that's what they say. 70 degrees every day and yeah, it doesn't change much. Well, if you need some outdoor act activity uh, advice or equipment, come see Joey at Mountain Air Sports, Santa Barbara. <laughs> well, no matter where I go in California, I always seem to end up back in Santa Barbara. It's a place of mine for destination and to return to. It's one of the most beautiful spots uh, in the United States to me. The weather's always perfect, the people are friendly, the sky's usually blue, and there's great food, great little hotels to stay in. We're about a block from the beach, from the harbor, in a um, nice little hotel called the Harbor House. This room is just gorgeous. It's, um, it's Santa Barbara, it's Southern California. And the decor is nice, it's clean, it's fresh, but yet has a lot of character. And since I came back and we're staying two nights, the hotel offers a gift basket and it's complimentary for a two night stay or beyond. 
They make their own banana bread, and you know how much of a foodie I am, especially with pastries and bakery items. They make their own banana bread that's special. And orange juice, some cranberry juice, V8, apples, water, bananas, fruit bars, and um, some biscotti. Just a really nice gift that makes you feel very welcome. They usually don't show bathrooms, but this one, uh, it's got that old California flair. Uh, the, the tile and the glass block, I love it. It's a great place. One block off the ocean, you can walk right out, look down at the harbor view. They also have bicycles that you can um, take for a stroll. They just ask that they're back by sundown and they're free of charge if you rent the room. So it's a great little place here at the Harbor House and I'm looking forward to staying here. I'm in the courtyard of the Santa Barbara Courthouse and it's absolutely stunning. This is a free tour that you can come to Monday through Friday and you can walk in and out, around. You do have to be quiet because there is courts in session. The mural room is phenomenal. We're gonna head up there in just a little bit. And this is one of these places that's, you know, usually off the list of tourist things to do, but it's well worth the trip to come and see it. And like I said, it's free. We're inside the impressive, what they call mural room here in the Santa Barbara Courthouse. And the unique thing about this, these are still utilized. Downstairs, there's uh, courts in session right now. This is a phenomenal place to see. It's free, uh, it's, it's public grounds. So you can come in here and enjoy this. You just gotta be quiet when you're walking by the, uh, the courtrooms that are in session. But that gives it also a unique perspective that uh, this is still being utilized today. And what a beautiful, beautiful piece of architecture. We're in the walkway area right outside the mural room here at the Santa Barbara Courthouse, and it's open to the air. You can see that it's open year round. These walls out here are about four foot thick. The doors are about 15 feet high. Very, very impressive piece of architecture. What a great place to come and visit and tour. Not only something built for art, but also something built for justice. come to Santa Barbara. You will not be disappointed. We're up the road about 30 miles from Santa Barbara, California in a place called Solvang. Solvang is a Danish village, as you can see. Came into existence in 1911. There was a Mexican land grant that was offered to people from um, Denmark that was living in the Midwest to bring them out here to, to give them this land and to create a, a Danish village culture, to bring their farming skills, to bring their engineering skills, to bring their cultural skills. As with much of the um, Europeans, when they go to an area that is desolate or cannot grow anything, the engineering, aqueducts, this, that, everything else, they create a vibrant community out of much of nothing. And that is what they have done here. Now, in present day, many grapes are grown here. There's a lot of wineries. There's tons of vineyards, as, as mentioned. And uh, well known throughout the world for their, for their winemaking abilities and the, and the quality of the grapes that are here. You know, it reminds me much of what happened in uh, Texas and how the Alamo came about was the Mexican nationals there invited the Germans in to build the area because they couldn't grow that many crops there. And when the Germans got there and built it up, they wanted them out and the Germans said no. So that's how that started that, that war. But anyway, even back then, they uh, realized the importance of Europeans bringing their culture, their uh, wherewithal, their knowledge, and their advanced farming techniques to the region to make something beautiful 
and also viable. I'm here with one of my relatives, Gunnar Peterson, the milkman. He gets a little shy on camera, a little stiff and wooden-like. But anyway, he's promised that if you come to Solvang, you're going to get great pastries, great bakery items, food, culture, and a great time in wonderful weather in beautiful Solvang, California. About a mile north of San Simeon, and this is where the Hearst Castle is located. I would put that on a really high to-do list, and there's several different tours you can take. We just got to tour the one level, which was the great room, which if you only get to do one, that's the one I would choose. That way you get to see the uh, movie theater that he had, where he had movie stars up from Hollywood, um, entertaining a lot of guests, the dining room, the, you get to see the, uh, the pools, the indoor pool, the outdoor pool, phenomenal place. I would definitely put this on your to-do list. This is the gateway right here to the Big Sur. Big Sur is uh, from here north, about 200 miles, this, this stretch of road. We're waiting, we, we got up early this morning, but we have to wait for the um, fog to burn off, which happens about 10, 11, 12 o'clock every day, as long as it's not going to rain. And that's because of the coolness of the Pacific. The Pacific is much cooler than the, Atlant the Southern Atlantic is and then you have the heat of the desert. So those two combining, well, you create this fog layer and it takes the middle of the day for it to burn off. The views here are phenomenal. It's um, very majestic. So much to do on the list of stopping right here, San Simeon. I do advise if you're um, looking to come here and stay for a couple days, you might wanna bring some food. There's not a whole lot of grocery stores here. There are a few restaurants. I will say that they are fairly expensive, and um, so if you're in for that, do it. If not, bring lunch, meat, cheese, bread, breakfast items, you'll be good to go. Well, about five miles north of San Simeon, you'll find a little cove where the elephant seals like to hang out. And right below me, there's a whole, I don't know what you call them, a gaggle, a, a swarm. I don't know what they are when there are a bunch of them together, but there's probably about 40 of them laying down here, sunning themselves. Now, they look uh, real cute, like you wanna go down and pet them, but I would not advise that. They can be extremely violent when they want to be. They're good to view from a distance. And this is one of those things that is absolutely free to stop and take a look at. You don't, you're not in the zoo. This is in their habitat. So it's uh, nature, you're right here beside it, and you get to see it right here in Central Coast, California. We're here in the heart of Salinas Valley, California. And as you can see, massive agriculture right to the left of me. So as you're making your way up the Pacific coast, you get to see where most all your strawberries come from, uh, tomatoes, of course that's over in the valley too. But a lot of your agriculture comes from right here. So as you're driving through, you get to see where it comes from to your grocery, grocery store. Roadside stand, Salinas, California. All this, $1.49. I seen the sign outside and I had to pull in to see if it was true. 12 grapefruit for a dollar. And if you only bought uh, individually 10 cents each, and they're actually grapefruit for 10 cents. Some plums, 
a larger grapefruit. So this is snacks for the next two days at a very reasonable price. And it's all grown right here in Salinas Valley or close by. As you know, we just pop into places. It's destination unscripted, as it says. And we're driving down one Pacific Coast Highway, come through Santa Cruz, and I've seen a sign. And you know, anytime I see something with pastries, bakery, or chocolatier, I've got to go in. This is one of the Donnelly brothers, and I've seen a sign out front that says one of the top 10 chocolatiers by National Geographic. We appreciate you guys coming in. It's, a, it's always nice to have people come in and do a little bit of filming. Uh, we're in Santa Cruz, California. We're about 75 miles south of San Francisco. We've been making chocolate here since 1988. And we start out with a, a really great French chocolate, Valrona. We melt it, we temper it, we put it into molds, we flavor it. Uh, we make a, a whole line of truffles. We make a line of candy bars. We make a really great ice cream bar that's popular in the summertime. It has a great vanilla ice cream with uh, our honey vanilla caramel and dark chocolate blend with a little bit of sea salt. Uh, we have a full line of candy bars, caramel bars, things like that. We ship all over the country, all over the world. Not so much around the world anymore. You know, the last recession took out a lot of the international business. The cost, right. the cost went up, um, but people in the press say really nice things about us. And we, uh, we always appreciate National Geographic. Now, is this a, a family tradition? I noticed some uh, older pictures from like the 1940s, maybe? That's 50s? My mother, she's okay. uh, 94 now. During the holidays, she'll come in, she'll help us out three or four days a week. She's still, you know, she'll cup stuff and give out samples. Uh, she was a real estate developer and a uh, stock investor. And my dad was an attorney and a politician. Okay. So That's quite a background. It is. <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah. To go from that into candy. Yeah, it was. <laughs> you know, and my brother uh, did a year in college in Washington, D.C. He worked in a law firm for the summer, uh, and he decided that he didn't want to be a lawyer. So right. he went to uh, La Varenne in Paris, went to school for six months, and then he worked at different places for about four years. And then he came to this country and pretty quickly opened up the shop. Are you, uh, I detect it, Boston or? We grew up in uh, Situate in Worcester, Massachusetts. Okay, close, close. Yeah, close. It's close. close. The Donnelly name. I go back, right? I, I, <laughs> yeah, I try to go back and fish uh, for a month every year to Cape Cod. Oh, that's so, great. So I still have a little bit of an accent. When you're coming through Santa Cruz, make sure and give at least 10 to 30 minutes in here and meet the Donnelly Brothers. Thank you very much. And you will not be disappointed. Their chocolate and their candies, phenomenal. We appreciate phenomenal. you guys stopping by. Thank you. Next time I'll uh, give you a call and I'll have a shave before what, you what, what, It's unscripted, yeah. right? right? Truly yeah. unscripted. That's yes, great, thank well, you. I look forward to seeing it. Thank you. We're in the heart of Sonoma County, and many people come here and just make this a one-stop destination. They'll either fly in or make it a long weekend or a week stay, of course, because of the vineyards and wineries. But there's other things to do here as well. It's a beautiful area for bicycling, hiking, and other outdoor adventures, as well as many fine restaurants. So as you can see behind me, lush vineyards, beautiful hillsides, and near-perfect climate for your enjoyment and stay here in Sonoma County. We're in between Sonoma County and the Avenue of the Giants in this beautiful, majestic area of California. And it's the gateway to the Redwoods and it's hard to describe. I, I doubt that the camera is going to do it justice. Take time, grab a picnic lunch, sit out here and enjoy these beautiful vistas and views. And you 
thought you were looking at average everyday trees. We are in the beautiful Redwood National Forest, actually the Avenue of the Giants to be exact. And we stayed right up the road in a place called Miranda, which is in the heart of the Avenue of the Giants. These beautiful, majestic redwood trees tower 300 foot and more. And around the base, they can measure 50, 55 feet in circumference. This is truly the only place in the world that you will find these. Well worth it to make it this way, this far, even if you've flown into Southern California, it's a good day's drive, solid day's drive, unless you're taking the coast and it's a two day drive to get up here. But these truly are one of the wonders of the world and it's not something you're gonna to wanna to miss. Well, I chose a unique place here in the Redwoods called Miranda Gardens. It's a family owned cabins. So it's really cool. You get to really immerse yourself in the Redwood culture, I guess, uh, being out in the woods. They have a campfire late at night, have a little market, a little restaurant across the street. And you're right here at the beginning of the Avenue of the Giants. Actually, it's inside. There's a, there's a little trail of the Avenue of the Giants and there's a break in this little town called Miranda and then it goes on. So you're really inside the Avenue of the Giants and it breaks for about a half a mile where this town is. So we're gonna go ahead and check out the little cabin here and see what it looks like. This is a great choice. Makes me feel like I'm in the Redwood National Forest here in California. The dark wood, the decor, the specialty lamps. It's unique, it's individual, it's uh, cultural, it's special. I think I'm in for a great night. I may choose the restaurant across the street, might go down to the market, get some deli meat, and set out at the campfire tonight and have a sandwich. But right now, I'm gonna get my bags in here, clean up just a little bit, and head up the road to the rest of the Avenue of the Giants. We're just south of Crescent City, California, north of the Klamath River, one of the crossings where you, you cross the Klamath River, which is well known for salmon. Uh, the smoked salmon around this area is phenomenal. And of course, behind me, you see Paul Bunyan and Babe, the big blue ox. And if you've had that story told to you in the past when you were a child, you remember when Babe and Paul Bunyan came up against the little guy with the chainsaw. It was automation versus brawn. It was a great story. It was one of my favorites as a child. Of course, growing up in the Pacific Northwest where logging was big, um, it's iconic. Anyway, behind here is the Trees of Mystery. Neat little place, well worth your stop. Um, got some unique, I'm not gonna tell you what's in there because it's the Trees of Mystery. But anyway, great little shop, little museum inside there about the area. It's worth the stop here in Northern California. In Crescent City, California, getting ready to go across the border into Oregon. We want to stop for lunch. And I'll tell you what I always look for. Uh, that is work trucks in a place that's kind of like the hole in the wall look. And I'll tell you why. Because workers in an area know where great food at a great price is. And so I found Perlita's Mexican Cafe. The food was phenomenal. The price is outstanding. It's one of those little places that you just want to stop, grab some lunch, grab some dinner, whatever you don't. You're not going to spend a fortune, but you're going to have a great meal and a good experience. I'm in Bandon, Oregon with the famous Face Rock. And the history behind Face Rock, well, this is the Indian legend. And the, of course, the Indians were the second peoples through here that we can trace back. The first, of course, was the Icelandic people. And they were here 10, 12,000 years ago. Then the uh, American Indian was here on the scene there after that. We don't know what happened to the 
to the uh, Icelandic people. They were killed off. We don't know whether it was hostile or whether it was disease and famine. We don't know. But the story behind Face Rock through the American Indians was that a beautiful Indian princess came here and she was to be adorned and to have a festival for her. And during the time of the festival, she had a basket and the basket was, I've heard either full of kittens or raccoons or other wild animals and a dog, a loyal dog. And so she took him out to the beach and she told the dog to watch the animals in the basket while she went out for a swim. And as she went out for a swim, a sea monster took its big black hand up and drug her down and was trying to get her to look into his eyes. And through the legend, this sea monster, if you looked into his eyes, you were owned by him. She knew better, she didn't look into the eyes. And during this tussle, the dog went out to try to save her, taking the kittens or raccoons or whatever it was in the basket. And the dog let go of the basket and bit the sea monster. The sea monster became so enraged that it threw the dog and the other animals out and to the left. And that's those rocks that you see on your right, my left. And then she was laid at, at the low tide the next morning they found her dead in the sea and she was gazing up towards the, the, the sun and that was to not look into the sea monster's eyes and therefore she's forever mortalized in the rock sculpture that uh, she turned into stone and that's how the Indian legend is that the face rock be king. Anyway, it's a beautiful place to come watch the sunset, you get the sunrise from the east into the west and the sunset comes down over here. Beautiful golden glow and Bannon, Oregon is just a beautiful rugged coastline. Well, I've read about it and I've heard about it and now I'm here to try it. The Bannon Fish Market, Fish and Chips and Chowder House. They say they have the best clam chowder in Oregon and some of the best halibuts that you'll taste. The halibut is my favorite fish. I hope they still have some left because we got here just a little bit late. So I'm going to go in and grab me a box of fish and chips. It has arrived halibut on the Oregon coast. This is supposed to be one of the best fish and chip houses all up the Oregon coast. So I'm really looking forward to this. Halibut is my favorite of all the fish in the world. Flaky, white, clean, and this is fresh. I've seen it behind the little glass window there. We're ready to go. Wonderful. Mm. It's been a long time and a long wait. There's nothing like fresh fried halibut. The chatterer has arrived, which is, uh, this is what they're really known for too, is the best chatter in Oregon, clam chowder. There's the first test. Mm. Phenomenal. You're going to want to stop here. Bannon, Oregon. Fish and chips. Halibut. Chowder. It's all you need. Well, the reviews were spot on. This is a five out of a five. The Bandon Fish Market. Fish and chips. Great halibut. Awesome chowder. I'm really bad because I got one to go for later on. So I ate one in there and I'm going to take one back to the room. You don't get this everywhere. I spent the night here at the Bandon Inn in Bandon, Oregon. And the inn overlooks the little village downtown and then across the uh, bay area out into the sea. Uh, Bannon used to be a fishing village, still is, but it's also tourist related now and a few other small industries. The room was great, quiet, the beds are super comfortable, nice little breakfast, and the hospitality here that was shown to us was phenomenal. Very friendly, very helpful, 
Bannon, Oregon is definitely one of those places you do want to stop and check out. We're north of Florence, Oregon, right in the middle of Oregon's coastline at the Sea Lion Caves. Now, this was uh, discovered in 1880 by Captain William Cox, and it's been in existence. Well, they built the um, the elevator shaft. They finished it in 61, so they started that in 59. So you know this has been around a while. It's a great attraction, well worth the visit, well worth the stop. A lot of great things in there, and wonderful fresh popcorn. We're inside the gift area and where you purchase your tickets to go down into the sea lion caves and out to see the mating beach also. And not only do they have sea lions here, but you never know when you're gonna run across a squatch. And they have official field guides for finding Bigfoot. And uh, I guess how to talk to him if you do. On my way down the path from the gift shop, which you'll walk about 150, 200 yards down to the elevator. Well, we're going down the shaft 215 feet. It took them two years, and they only operated in the spring of blasting and drilling because the sea lions were out of the cave at that point, as we're here right now, and they're mating out on the shore. So, two years, still in use today, you drop 215 feet in less than 50 seconds. It's a nice, smooth ride. It's still operating very well. Most of the sea lions are not in the cave at this point, this mating season, so they're out on the rocks, getting a little sun here on the Oregon coast. We're in Lincoln City, Oregon, and I was very happy to see that the Bijou Theater is still in business. This single screen theater started in 1937 and it's still in operation today. And it runs first run movies. It also runs second run movies during the matinee for $2. Uh, there's a little bit of significance with this theater and me. This is where my parents had their first date in 1959. And they came here, had a great date, I'll move this way a little bit around this truck. And after their date, which they had during the middle of the day, they went to a bakery across the street here. It's still in operation. So both things are still in operation. And that's great to see in a town because it means the independent business, that money that was generated in these businesses stay in these towns. Not like the big multinational corporations where the money all goes back to a headquarters somewhere else. So I was pleasantly surprised to see the Bijou still in business. I asked the people around here, do people really go to watch movies here? They said, absolutely. They choose this 10 times over one to the other theater, the multiplex down the road. The seats are so comfortable, they said they're almost rocky to sleep. So anyway, a good success story since 1937, still in operation, still in business. And I guess if my parents, this place wouldn't have been here, maybe my parents wouldn't have had their first date, I wouldn't be here. We're in Tillamook, Oregon at the world famous Tillamook Cheese Factory. And when I say world famous, I mean world famous. They have won the award of best cheddar cheese in the world. This was started in 1909, but it didn't start as a cheese factory. It started as a butter producing plant. And they would take the butter and laden it with salt because the cows here only produce milk two to three months out of the year. They would laden the salt in the butter, ship the butter out, and the salt kept the butter from turning rancid. They'd ship the butter out where it went. They would wash the salt out, left with great butter. Later on, they started to make cheese and then ice cream. They used Holsteins and Jerseys, which are the highest butter fat and milk fat producing cows there are. So if you come through Tillamook, Oregon, you gotta stop and see the Tillamook Cheese Factory. We're inside the production facility of the Tillamook Cheese and Ice Creamery and you can actually watch actual production when it's going on earlier in the daytime. The quality of the standard at Tillamook Cheese 
is the ultimate. They have one best cheddar cheese in the world. I grew up about 50 miles inland from here, and then when I moved east, I continued to tell people, Tillamook cheese, Tillamook cheese, Tillamook cheese. Of course, you couldn't get the ice cream there. But once you've tasted it, it's like no other cheddar cheese you'll taste. Well, this is the Cheese Junkies Altar. Free samples at the end of the tour. And some of the best cheese in the world. How can you beat this? Look at all this cheese here, here, over here. Where do you even start and where do you finish in one of the world's best cheese makers? Well, I know where I'm gonna start, in the ice cream parlor. This line is no joke. This is the ice cream line. These are some serious foodies here because they know where to come and to line up at the trough of greatness. We're in a small, quaint, charming town of Wheeler, Oregon, just north of Garibaldi and south of Cannon Beach. Cannon Beach has one of the largest monoliths in the world, reaching over 235 feet. It's a photographer's favorite, and you, I'm sure you've seen the picture of the big monolith coming out of the ocean and the water behind it. Just a stunning sight. One of the cool things about the Oregon coastline here is you can take a train all the way up the coastline on the 101. And this is one of the stops here in Wheeler. Just a cool way to see the coast. You can get off in a small town, spend the night, get back on the next day and head north or go south. Here in Cannon Beach, Oregon, with the famous Cannon Beach Rock behind me, it is the, one of the world's largest monoliths at 235 feet. Now, fortunately, we got here at low tide, so the tide on the Pacific in this range really goes out far. Uh, unlike where, where I'm from in South Carolina, the tide will go in and out maybe 50, 70 feet. Here it goes out about, uh, I would guesstimate, about 900 feet or a thousand feet out and in every day. So we get to come out here, get really close to the rocks and uh, get some great shots, some great visuals and a great time. It is a really, really a scenic place here that you'll want to stop, take some pictures, maybe have a picnic lunch out here on the beach. northeast quadrant of Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon has a wide variety of eclectic shops, restaurants, places to go, things to see, and the architecture downtown is really cool. Of course, it was started as a port city, so a lot of ships come through here. Uh, Timber built this city, and also the, the trade between the Pacific Rim, the Asian Rim into Portland, brought a lot of trade into Portland. But now it's turned into a, a um, a very vibrant area where you can get just about any type of cuisine that you want and find any type of shopping you want. Portland also has a beautiful view of Mount Hood, which is where we're on our way to now. So we will see you in Mount Hood. Stop by Portland for some great eats and great shopping. We're up at the Timberline Lodge on Mount Hood in Oregon. Timberline Lodge, the reason it's named that is because this is where the timber stops growing. You get up so much higher than this, then there's not enough for the trees. This lodge was built during the Depression by the Three Cs, which was a government program which put people to work when there was no work. And uh, they built a beautiful lodge here. It's got a world-class restaurant called the Cascade Room. And I'm looking forward to my stay here and the beautiful vistas and views behind the camera, which I'll show you in just a second.
The stay at Timberline was absolutely phenomenal. The Cascade dining room, the chefs there, high marks, wonderful food, wonderful service, great place. Happened to be up there on uh, summer solstice night, which was really cool. It was clear, you could see the stars. And we're about 45, 50 miles east, southeast of Mount Hood. And as you can see, it turns into a desert-like atmosphere. It's arid, and if we were to go another 40 or 50 miles east, you'll notice the, the trees disappear. You're left with brush, sagebrush, sagebrush. It's um, a lot hotter, drier. And when you see pictures of Oregon, you always see the coastline. You see the Willamette Valley, where a lot of fruits and vegetables and flowers are grown. And then you see the Cascade Range. Uh, you don't see much of this when you think of Oregon if you haven't been here. But about two thirds of Oregon is desert. Vast, wide open spaces. I kind of like this uh, look. Reminds me of maybe what the Old West, cowboys, things like that. Well, we're back where we started in San Diego, California. We hope you've enjoyed this trip up the Pacific Coast Highway with the John over to Mount Hood. We look forward to seeing you on our next trip. I'm Jerry Dalton, Destinations Unscripted.